Chinese Cinderella is one of the non-fiction extracts in your blue Edexcel anthology. And we're going to deal with a, a few points, not everything, but just a few points that you could make about this text. To start off with, you could make sure that you slip in some points about form and structure. So it's an extract from an autobiography. Uh, and so therefore, obviously, is written in the first person. And it's written in the past tense because she's recounting her experiences when she was younger. It starts off with a, a section of orientation. That just means kind of sort of setting the scene. Um, but make sure you use that term orientation. It describes her being at boarding school and she's with her friends and she's dreading going home. So that's what the first few paragraphs are about. And then uh, suddenly she gets this message that she's been called home and doesn't know why. And there's a lot of tension surrounding that. Um, she says, you know, she, she has the impression that maybe someone's died and you get the impression that, that maybe that's the only time she's ever been suddenly called home. Normally she's just left at boarding school um, until the end of term. So there's a lot of tension where she's not quite sure why she's being called home and uh, there's this, the prospect of meeting her father. Um, when she gets home, there's very much this representation, uh, this portrayal of her father as an intimidating figure. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but there are a few paragraphs which very much focus on that. Then we focus on the, the conversation with her father for the rest of the passage. And he very much dominates the conversation in terms of length of utterance. That just means that he speaks more than she does. Um, and if you look at the length of the paragraphs, you can see that he speaks at length, um, followed by very brief questions and statements and responses by Adeline. Um, he also controls the agenda. Um, so he's the one that controls what's being spoken about and, and the direction the conversation will go. And in pragmatic terms, he also controls the outcome. He has it all planned from start to finish. He is very much in control of the whole conversation. Um, and so therefore, the representation of him as a, a powerful man that seeks to dominate and control is, is the, the, air, the, the route that you'd want to go down. Um, as the conversation goes on, though, there is a shift. So it shifts from the tension and fear that she initially felt. Um, there's an element of that all the way through because she's very much aware that she, she can't afford to upset her father, but it, it shifts towards overwhelming joy. There's a real sense of relief and excitement and anticipation at the prospect of escape. Um, and so I think focusing on the contrast there um, between the, the initial emotions and then how that develops later on in the passage will be worth doing. In terms of how Adeline is presented, um, initially, I think it's interesting to look at how she doesn't fit into to traditional Chinese or Hong Kong culture in the 1950s in terms of the obsession with acquisition of money and status with her father, for instance, seems to uh, see it, that's very much seems what seems to sort of drive him in his life. Um, I think the reference to Monopoly is quite interesting in that sense. So it says four of us were playing Monopoly. My heart was not in it and I was losing steadily. The idea of Adeline's heart not being in the game of Monopoly, I think, is interesting in that if you think about it, Monopoly is a game all about money. It's all about acquiring capital and property and succeeding and and defeating your opponents within a sort of capitalist society. Do you know what I mean? If you think about it, that's what the game is about. She's not really interested in that. Her friend is and the others are. But it's, oh, yeah, Monopoly, I can give it or take it, really. You know, it's it, it, it's um, it, it's not really what Madeline's all about. She's about reading and writing and playwriting and imagination, isn't she? She's very different in that sense. So there's a real contrast to her peers um, and also obviously therefore to her father's values as they're represented later in the passage. Secondly, she positions herself, that just means she represents herself as worthy of our sympathy as readers. Um, she emphasises this idea of her being neglected by her parents. It's quite telling, I think, that um, when she is called home, it's only a short drive home. And yet she's never been there. So she hasn't even been told that her parents have moved, her family have moved. She, she doesn't know. You know, when, when the chauffeur pulls up outside the house, she has no idea what house it is. Um, uh, but also the idea that, you know, if, if it's only a short drive, if it's only, you know, a few minutes drive, why on earth has no one been to see her? You know, they, surely they could pop and see her in the evenings or at weekends or whatever. OK, but not only does she not know where they live, but they've, they've not taken the opportunity to just think, ah, oh, let's pop and see Adeline this weekend. 
Um, so it suggests that she, she's very much neglected, I think. Um, when she arrives back as well, she's not greeted by her relatives. Her dad's in the study, her mother is, um, is elsewhere, and her, her brothers and sisters are by the pool. I think her mother's playing bridge. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's a very, very unusual event, Adeline suddenly coming home like this. And yet when she gets home, there's none of her relatives to greet her. Um, think how that must feel from her point of view. Um, look back as well to, to when she was uh, at boarding school and just thinking of the, the few weeks that there were ahead before she'd, she'd go home. She was dreading it, wasn't she? There's that really interesting simile where it says, the thought of leaving school throbbed at the back of my mind like a persistent toothache. Kind of constantly there, throbbing in the background, reminding her of the, the pain and the misery and the torture to come. You know, it, having an impact on her everyday life. Um, never really able to enjoy life because she just thinks it's going to finish soon and I'm going to go home where I'm not welcome and not valued. Um, during the course of the passage, though, she grows in confidence, I think. And, and you could look at these two adverbs that very much emphasise that. Um, one is where she is just about to knock on her father's door and it says, timidly, I knocked on the door. Um, but then later it talks about her boldly asking him a question and so there's a real contrast isn't there between those two adverbs and that shows her growing in confidence in the course of the passage finally there's an she's very aware i think of the need to submit to her father's authority overtly in order to achieve her desired escape so she's very much aware that even when her father seems to suggest that she might be able to go to university and might be able to leave hong kong and go to england she has her own thoughts about where she'd like to go and what she'd like to do and study and so on. But she's very aware that she can't upset her father, even now, even having won the competition, having got his agreement for her to be able to go abroad. The last thing she wants to do now is to jeopardise that. And so um, underlying her her joy and her excitement about it all is um, this this underlying fear of her father constantly because of his authority. Look at when it says, I waited in silence. I did not wish to contradict him. He's not someone that you contradict. And then finally, we could look at the portrayal of Adeline's father. As we've said, he's very much an authority figure. Look at that line where it says, I had been summoned by father to enter the Holy of Holies. The verb summon suggests the, the power of a court or a judge or a king, doesn't it? Um, it's a really interesting verb choice there. And then the Holy of Holies is the normally referred to as the, the innermost part of the, the temple where only the, the high priest would be able to enter. Um, normally, this is a forbidden place. Um, it's a place that only God and, and, and the, the person with the highest authority within a religion would be able to enter. But she's allowed to go in for once. Um, so it very much represents him as a... Uh, a very sort of judgmental, authoritative, divine figure, not a not a kind of loving, caring father so much, um, but someone who casts judgment that you should be afraid of. Um, look at when he starts talking to her, even though it's he seems quite jovial and positive, doesn't he? She doesn't have quite how to take that, does she? She's kind of quite unnerved, unsettled by the idea of him being so jovial and positive and thinks, oh, is this just a ruse? Is this just some kind of trick? Is he going to suddenly flip and switch and start being critical of me? But when he does start talking to her and says, sit down, sit down, don't look so scared. Um, here, take a look. Look at all the imperatives there. Sit, sit, don't, take. Yeah, there's all these commanding verbs. And that shows that well, that's what he does. That's how he conducts conversations. He issues orders. He issues commands. He very much, as, as we've said, dominates the conversation in terms of utterance length. Um, there's, a, there's the facade of listening. He does ask some questions. He does say, oh, so what would you want to study then? Um, but actually, that's exposed by the end of the conversation where it's revealed that he had a plan all along, um, that he would decided where she was going to go, what she was going to study, and that actually her her responses and replies are kind of irrelevant. The, the, the only thing that, that asking questions achieves is giving her the opportunity to say what he wanted her to say in the first place. 
And if she does, well, then he's he's doubly pleased. If she doesn't, well, then he just says no and contradicts them and decides anyway. Um, so she has no real agency. She has no real opportunity to influence her own future or to act on her own behalf. She's completely under her father's control in that sense. He is only interested in face and reputation and status and public standing. There's that bit, isn't there, where um, this is on line 55. It says he looked radiant for once he was proud of me in front of his revered colleague, Si Wai Tung, a prominent fellow businessman also from Shanghai. I had given him face. Uh, kind of yeah, face there kind of represents, you know, this idea of reputation and status in front of um, someone else in the community that was respected in business terms. Um, look at how he speaks to her at the bottom of the page, and you'll notice lots of modal verbs, in particular the, the verb will. Um, it's not, well, you could go, maybe you could learn, you, you, you might want to consider. There's no might, there's no could, there's you will. You will go, you will go, you will learn. It's this very, very forceful modal verb being used, isn't it? Um, and he's denying the possibility of any objection or any compromise. 